Well, thank you for joining us. And first of all, thanks to all of the girls that competed at Crossroads last weekend. Congratulations and good luck to those girls performing this weekend. I wish you all the best. Um, let's do some introductions of our panel. Uh, Sue Weber, would you like to get us started off? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me. Um, like I kind of mentioned, Colorado Crossroads is one of my favorite tournaments to go to. So I appreciate them having us uh, you know, be able to present today. And a little bit about my background, I'm a director of events here at NCSA, Next College Student Athlete. And if you were there last weekend or coming next weekend, we do have a booth um, at the facility down by the marketplace and t-shirts and everything where we get your height and standing reach and jump approach um, measured, which is kind of a cool deal to do. But what, we, what NCSA does is help families and athletes through the recruitment process. So answer questions, help with highlight video, and we're going to go over a few of those questions today. Um, my background is in volleyball, and I actually played at the University of Illinois. I was an outside hitter there for four years, and then I started uh, coaching. So I coached at a smaller NAIA program to start with, went to two different Division I programs at St. Louis University and University of Northern Colorado, and then I joined NCSA about five years ago. Um, started as a recruiting coach, working one-on-one -on -one with families, and now I'm in the um, events department where I'll be traveling, thankfully, <laughs> now to uh, the different tournaments going through throughout the nation at qualifiers and whatnot. So thanks for having me, me here, Melissa. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Mike, would, would you like to do the honors of your introduction? Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Perez. I'd like to say welcome to everybody and congratulations to those that, you know, played this past weekend and, and good luck to those going to play in the upcoming weekend. Um, I'm here primarily because one, I'm a sponsor of the event along with Melissa, but uh, I was a former athlete as well. Um, currently, I'm a uh, loan officer in the mortgage business, but prior to be getting into the mortgage business, I was a uh, a college and pro quarterback. I played at uh, San Jose State, uh, went to high school here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and once my playing career was done at San Jose, I got drafted by the New York Giants and uh, played it with the Kansas City Chiefs, Houston Oilers. Some of you probably won't know who the Houston Oilers are. They're the former Tennessee Titans. <laughs> so, but it was uh, uh, an opportunity for me to get out here or get in front of you and speak. Uh, partly what I've done in the past and being recruited and going through the whole process, even though it was football and not volleyball, but I, I think it's all relative. Uh, I've had quite a few uh, friends that their daughters have played in these tournaments here in Denver. I even had the opportunity to go a couple of years ago where a friend of mine came up from, uh, from Houston, brought her daughters to play. So it was great for me to really see what really goes on. I've heard of all the the fun and all the teams that come from all over the country. And um, one, I just want to share my experience of, you know, being a recruited uh, from a different side. And I think once we get into it, I'll be able to let you know about my uh, process and um, about a little bit about college recruiting. So uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. I am Melissa Marney with Corkin and Company. We are a real estate group and we are sp helping sponsor this event as well. Um, and really my passion is about keeping women in sports and continuing to play, whether that's D1, D2, or D3, and just making sure that everyone knows their options and kind of helping parents navigate the process. Um, I'm sure as we've played many sports, it's difficult to know all of the different sports. And maybe if you're jumping into volleyball later, you're not sure on the recruitment process. And we're hoping that this will bring you some information. So with that, we can get started with one of the main questions that we see across the board is how can I start the recruiting process? So Sue, what are your thoughts on how parents can start to navigate the recruitment process? Yeah, uh, it's a great question too, right? So it's, and when does it start and when should I be doing things? So I, I always suggest the first and foremost is to start with what you know. So whether that's your preferences, um, such as do you want to stay close to home? Do you know what you want to study? Big school, small school, you know, and you don't have to have that laid out every single time you think about it, but to start thinking about that. Um, and they always change, you know, you're allowed to change your mind and have different opinions. Or if you go on a visit and you're like, hmm, you know, maybe I don't want to go super far away from home. So what I would do to start is to think about your preferences and then start looking at schools that 
fit those preferences. Um, if you're not, you're not sure where to start with that or which division, uh, I usually suggest five schools in each division or start with schools in your state and just start that you know, research process. Um, obviously with NCSA, we do offer online profiles so that's another way to start and you can put videos up there and put your club team and your schedule and coach college coaches can search for those um, sports resumes this is what I kind of call them your volleyball resume online and you can be proactive and reach out to those college coaches as well so the start, the start of the process is get to know what you want <laughs> start building that target list and then reaching out to college coaches Okay. Mike, do you have any insight on selecting different schools or parts of the country when you were going through the process? Well, you know, it, you know it, to what Sue said, you know, kind of select what you want and, uh, you know, where you want to go. And I think we all have an idea of where we want to go. And, and for me, it was, you know, I want to go to Division One, mm -hmm. but that's not how it turned out. Uh, I ended up going to a junior college because I didn't get recruited. I did get some NIA offers, smaller schools, but I thought, that I could uh, end up going uh, division one if I went to a junior college. So I went a different path. I took the junior college route and it worked out for me and I ended up at San Jose State. So, you know, what you want and, and the reality is sometimes different. So, you know, I wanted to go to a division one school right out of high school and I had certain schools that were on my list and unfortunately I didn't get recruited by any of them. So then I went to maybe a plan C and D where I, you know, I, I ended up going to a junior college. So. But your perseverance paid off. You ended up in the NFL regardless. So it's a great note for the girls to notice is that regardless of where you end up you're in college, there's still hope to keep going forward. Very true. And, yeah. and, it, 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 and it helps too to stay persistent. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Yeah. Um, so uh, just persevere and keep pushing. How, Sue, because of COVID, highlight videos have become so instrumental in the entire process. This question comes up very frequently. What should I put in my highlight video? What should I be What should I be working on? Yeah, and um, you know, it's it's pretty tough when you're not going to tournaments, right? And, and kind of restricted on on practice schedules and whatever else. Um, but usually, you can get into a gym with your with your coach, your club coach, or high school coach. And what I suggest is doing a skills video in a practice setting. So if you're an outside hitter and you play all the way around. You know, you're going to do some outside hits, you're going to do some blocking movements, you're going to do some defensive plays, um, some serve receive, and then a couple of maybe serves at the end. And that can supplement or take place until you can get some game fit footage um, at a tournament. And as far as, you know, what, obviously all the skills that you do as a player, but you want to put your wild plays first. So if you are thinking about game footage, you know, the overpass kill or the big stuff block or a super hustle play. I think it was probably four or five years ago when we saw the, the DS, it was like behind the service line with one hand, it was on ESPN top 10 plays. <laughs> it, they don't have to be like that dramatic, but that's the idea. You want to put those types of awesome plays first, maybe in the first uh, t 10 to 20 seconds and then get into your skill work. Yeah, we, I have interviewed some other co college coaches and they had said that they may only give you 10 to 20 seconds to start. So really mm -hmm. make sure that that first 10 to 20 seconds is impactful and then eventually go into a full game play. Cause they do want to see you in full game settings, whether it's not just your highlight video. However, they may only have 10 to 20 seconds to make sure they continue to watch your video. So right. just putting that up front yep. is really helpful. Um, how, one of the other questions for, for players is how do I know if a college coach is interested in me? What are the signs? What are the things that they should be looking for? Yeah, and there's there's different different rules, communication rules for different divisions. So sometimes it is a little difficult to understand. Like I've been emailing this coach, and they've been opening my emails or you know follow me on Twitter, but I have no idea what that means. Um, if you get any activity from a college coach, it's usually a pretty good sign that they're evaluating you. So what most college coaches do is evaluate student athletes for um, months, maybe years, depending on the on when they're starting the process. But if a college coach talks to your club coach or high school coach, especially at the division one or division two level before the June 15th, like magical date that they can talk to you, 
that's always a good sign that they're evaluating you. Um, if again, if they follow your profile, talk, speaking of NCSA, they can follow your profile or um, view your profile. That's always a good sign, and you should definitely look into that college college coach. But the number one is pick up the phone, call that coach, and, and have a conversation with them. Um, but usually, you'll do that after that college coach has initiated some type of activity with, with your profile or with your club and high school coach. Okay. Do or you if suggest they're sitting on your court <laughs> watching you forever. <laughs> you like you'll see them out of the corner of your eye, but um, that's pretty obvious one. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, that kind of segues into another question as far as what questions, what types of questions should they be asking the coach when they're emailing them, calling them, or um, able to speak to them live if they are, you know, watching them play? Yeah. And uh, questions will initiate responses, right? So I always advise that when you're, when you're emailing a college coach, just don't always put just sentences, right? If you ask something, they, hopefully they will respond if they can based on the NCAA communication rules. But ask if they're recruiting your position. Um, ask for a phone call. You don't have to wait for that coach to initiate that phone call. Um, ask what they look for in your position. So if you're a uh, libero, this is the one of the DS liberos are always later in the process for whatever reason and, and always one of the harder ones to evaluate. Um, but do coaches look for a really feisty, you know, very computer, communicative player or do they want to study Eddie, just do your job and, you know, it's almost like you're not even there because you're so smooth and quiet and, and just get the job done. So ask for what they're looking for in your position. Um, but make them respond back to you. You know, don't be afraid to be proactive and, and, and ask those questions. Don't ask for a scholarship right away, though. I will say that. <laughs> don't ask that on the first email. Leave the money until later. That's good advice for later in life as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get the process going, and then we can start talking. <laughs> what do college coaches evaluate? And that's another good one, because everybody thinks just volleyball skills, right? If you're an outside hitter, they're looking at how hard you can hit, how high you can jump. Obviously, yes, coaches are looking at that. But typically, they'll be looking to five, at five to ten girls for the same position or guys for the same position. And maybe they only have one or two scholarships available. So how are you going to differentiate yourself from those other five to ten recruits? And that's going to be communication skills. So on a phone call or on a Zoom or on a campus visit, are you just saying, yep, yep one word answers, are you engaged, asking questions, you know, and kind of presenting yourself well? Um, on the court, are you communicating with your teammates well? Are you paying attention in the huddle? Uh, if, if your coach is talking and you're off wandering trying to find your water bottle, you know, we, we evaluate that. <laughs> um, I even, in my coaching days, I even have come early to a court and we all know that tournaments don't run on time. So one of the recruits was was blind judging and she made a gusty call. She was like, yes, that ball's in. And all the parents were like yelling at her. And she's like, no, that ball was in. So she was paying attention and, and strong with her commitment to that. So I like put that in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's not just your volleyball skills. It's the whole package because coaches want to know if you're going to fit with their culture and what kind of character you have. Um, they want to bring that into their into their team as well as good athletes. Mike, do you have any comments on that as far as off the field play, off the field? I think they just really want to see, you know, leadership skills, mm -hmm. uh, as Sue said, and how you interact with other people in adverse situations, whether it relates to volleyball or not, in different aspects uh, of life. So I think it all you know, correlates, you know, on the field and off the field. So I think they look at every little aspect uh, yeah. of you as a person and how it works on the field and off the field or the court, should I say. Um, yeah. And they evaluated, you know, all of it. And that's, that's a good point. And sometimes it's how you react to errors versus mm -hmm. like, it's easy to celebrate when things are going good, but how are you when, when the, the going gets tough and it's tight points and you just made an error, are you going to come back and, kill the next ball or are you like is it one air turn into two three four airs yeah exactly do you look defeated or are you ready to go for the next right play? right 
what if, what are the for the girls what do i talk about with a college coach so if they are engaging with a college coach what should they be talking to them about yeah and that that first conversation is going to be pretty um relaxed you know it's just a get to know you type of conversation so coaches may ask you about your family and what you want to study and like all those general preference questions but you want to ask them about them as <laughs> well. It's a two-way street. Um, so once you get into those conversations, you don't want to say yes to that first offer or first conversation only, and that's like your only school that you're talking to. You want to kind of play the field, so to speak. Um, so you ask them about their coaching philosophy, or you ask them why why do they like coaching at the school they are coaching at. Um, that'll give you some insight on is administration like supportive of a volleyball. Volleyball is not the big football basketball program that brings in a lot of revenue, but some programs are much well, more, you know, well supported from administration purposes. So if a coach talks about that, um, you know, the fan experience, maybe the fans are awesome. At Illinois, we had the fans are right up to the court and we had a, a bike squad and like it's a really cool environment. So, that, you know, you can ask about those types of things. And then just how they're doing with COVID. Honestly, I think we we lose that human to human empathy sometimes. Um, and I think that's a, a great like lead in and a mature question to ask coaches about, you know, how's your team doing? What are you guys doing for the fall? Or do you have camps going with the summer with all, all everything going on? So be a human <laughs> and ask human questions too. That's perfect. Okay, we'd like to welcome anyone who is here live to answer, ask any questions in the chat box. We do have some that were previously emailed in, but if you have any additional questions, we'd love for you to add those to the chat box on the side. So one of the questions that's come in by email is, should we focus on a D1, D2, D3, or NAIA? You know, what are the differences and what might one expect in between yeah. those divisions? Um, and lots of differences, honestly, it's you know, with, with volleyball, division one is a head count sport. So different than say softball or baseball, soccer, where it's either all athletic scholarships or only academic scholarships. And for division one, there's 12 athletic scholarships that a coach can offer in any given year. So 12 girls are on, on athletic scholarships, but as we know, there's 15 to 20 on a roster. So those additional are recruited. They're recruited walk-ons is what their title is, I guess you could say but they're only on academic or um, academic scholarships or grants. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about division one, but it's the most competitive. It's very business-like, you know, it's gonna be 40 to 50 hours worth of work between going to class, going to practice, you're traveling on the weekends, um, and you may put in some extra work, especially if you're a setter, you're gonna do some, it's kind of like a quarterback, <laughs> right, Mike? You're gonna put in some extra rep, reps, um, off to the side or on your own. Um, for Division II and NAIA, these are, what's really nice about these is they're still very competitive. I would say the top 50 are compete um, Division I programs. They kind of, you know, every division kind of overlaps. Um, but the financial part of Division II and NAIA is very attractive because you can stack academic and athletic scholarships. So, for the most part, when I'm talking with volleyball athletes, they're pretty good students. I don't know if we're type A personalities across the board, um, but you know it's a great financial option. And there's more flexibility with the schedule sometimes. You're still gonna have spring practice. Um, you're still gonna have a very um, business-like fall season, but there is a little bit more flexibility in the spring for, um, you know, there's more social activities, I guess you could say. And then division three, Still can be very competitive, but it's going to be more of an academic focus. So there's only academic scholarships and grants provided at, at um, Division III programs, and that's across the board, um, not just volleyball, but all sports. And uh, the nice thing about this is for the spring, there's still maybe some open gyms and some practices and, and whatnot, but it's, you can take labs and you can study abroad and you can join a sorority. You know, so there's a bunch of different flexes, or you can load up on your academics, you know, and, and take a lighter load in, in the fall season and then uh, load up on the hard classes in the off season. And what, one that they didn't ask about was junior college. And Mike would probably attest to this too, 
is that it's a great option to get your feet wet into the college scene. So um, there's usually junior colleges nearby your hometown or within an hour drive. I was looking at one because my mom was the HR person at a junior college. I was like, well, maybe I'll go there. It's, it's close. My mom works there. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> so um, it's another thing to, to look at, especially if you're maybe struggling with your academics. You can get into it. You can get your grades up um, and then easily transfer into any four-year um, university. And sometimes Division One coaches want that mature player who's going to be a junior, who's got two years experience. You usually play sooner than later at, at a junior college because it's freshmen and sophomores. So a lot of people kind of look away from it, but it's a great option, especially with COVID and, and the 2021, 2022 class has been super difficult um, with the recruiting process. So that could be another opportunity um, even to go one year and then transfer in. Mike, do you want to add any insight on any of the different divisions or going the JC route first? Um, I, I think, you know, what Sue said it, you know, well, um, and, you know, and I, I did visit some smaller schools, NAI schools, even Northern Colorado. Uh, and, and I will say this, I visited Northern Colorado and they said I couldn't play at their level. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> they knew that coaches? I could play at, at a higher <laughs> level, you know, which I didn't know, but it went, but I did visit some smaller schools and I just thought I was better than, 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 uh, what I saw, and so I took my chance and went to a, a junior college. Um, you know, like I said, it's not for everybody. It worked out for me. Um, if, if, you know, you don't go where you want to go or there are some complications with whether you're academics or, you know, some of the schools aren't there, maybe you take the chance and go to a uh, junior college and, and, and get that opportunity for the scholarship to a division one. So it's really what, what you feel and what, you know, how you're being recruited. Um, you know, which direction you want to go. But, you know, as Sue said, you know, there's a bunch of different ways and places for you to go. And, you know, there's an opportunity out there for you somewhere. We have a direct question. Yeah. I'm wondering if four years of high school volleyball is absolutely necessary for recruiting possibility. My daughter is on the fence about trying out next year. She'll be a junior and will continue playing club volleyball. So does Great. she have to yeah. do club volleyball and high school, and high school. to be recruited? Um, the short answer is no. Um, I would say 90% of club volleyball or recruiting happens at the club level, just because volleyball, college volleyball season is at the same time as most high school volleyball season. So it's, it's harder for college coaches to get to high school games to recruit because they're in their season. So they're going to recruit in the off season. So that alone, you know, is, is, is going to put you more towards the club route anyway. Um, I would say, you know, just as a high school student, you're only in high school once, you only have that opportunity to play with those, you know, for your school and for your coach and for your, your teammates and classmates. So in that aspect, you want to weigh the, the, the pros and cons, right, of do I want to play in high or play with my high school teammates because it's the only opportunity to do that. It's going to be totally different in college. It's not it's not that because everybody's on the same page. They all want to be competitive. They're all um, looking for that where some high schools are more of a social thing than a competitive thing. Um, but there's pros and cons to both of, both of those options, right? So is it necessary to get recruited? Uh, short answer, no, but you have to weigh the pros and cons to, to uh, make that decision. What, what is the best type of team to play for if academics is the first priority? Would you suggest going to a D3 school or is there a mix of, you know, D1, D2 that also offer that? Yeah, and that's, I, I did see that question come in too. And I was like, well, I mean, if you go to Yale, <laughs> it's a division one and it's super high academic or Stanford, right? Columbia, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I would say across the board, you can make an academic, you know, academics are your focus. Um, you can you can get a 4.0 at any university and get that degree. Um, that's going to help you in and like getting a job with Mike or getting you a job at you know with real estate. So I think first and foremost, go to a school and do well academically, just in general. So you could go to any division and do that. But as far as those Ivy Leagues or those uh, high academic programs, they're probably going to be Division three. Um, you know, NAI and D2 still have great degrees and, and you're going to be able to get a job with those degrees. But if you're going into, 
especially medical field or engineering or something very specialized, um, division three or the high Ivy League or high academic, um, you know, division one program are gonna be a focus. Um, if you're asking about the balance between academics and athletics and having a full kind of a holistic <laughs> college experience versus it's gotta be, is, this is your job, right? Playing volleyball is your job and you, you go to school too. Um, then I would say if you want a good balance, Division three um, and high academic programs would be your best bet. Okay, and I, and I would say I would want them to evaluate what they want to be and what their major is going to be and look at the college for, on that first also. Right, yeah. And evaluate the volleyball program on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, what types of schools are most likely to offer full ride scholarships for all four years? So all four years is the main question, not just yeah. scholarship, but full rides. Yeah, and, and this goes, any school except for a Division three program can actually offer a full athletic scholarship, depending on if they're fully funded and the school actually allows that. When I was coaching at NAI program, um, we could only offer an 80% athletic scholarship for whatever reason that that college decided that that was the restriction. So you won't know that. <laughs> As a recruit, you don't know that. Um, only when you're starting to communicate with that coach one-on-one -on -one and starting to get in that scholarship um, talk. But if a Division II is fully funded, they could give you a 100% athletic scholarship for all four years. So. That aside, <laughs> um, a coach will always tell you what the four-year plan is. So when you're offered a full scholarship your freshman year at, the, at a Division I program, so when I was going to Illinois, they were they told me I would get a scholarship. You know, I'm, where this is an offer for all four years. Um, there are especially the Barrows and BSs again for whatever reason. You you could get a two and two offer. So maybe your first two years you're walking on and paying your own way. And then your second two years are on full academic, or sorry, athletic scholarship. And that is going to be completely talked about and offered to you prior to your acceptance of that. So usually whatever you're offered your freshman year is going to be offered throughout the, the, the time you're going to be there. Um, red shirting will also be talked about on that, on that scholarship talk. Um, and that sometimes with Division II and NAI, they can increase per year. Rarely do they decrease your athletic scholarship um, year two, three, four. It usually goes up, <laughs> uh, depending on you know how much you're contributing. If you're getting awards, you're an all conference player, something like that. It, are they at risk of losing that scholarship if they have an injury? That was another question that came up. Yeah. So even if they were told they were getting four years of a scholarship and they were injured in the process. Right. So when you're at when you accept the um, verbal acceptance, or actually when you sign the dotted line, your national letter of intent for division one, division two, you're signing with the university versus the volleyball program. And sometimes that gets lost in translation, but um, so that university is, is saying, yes, we're gonna give you a scholarship for, for all four years or, or whatnot. Um, and injuries are part of the game. I think Melissa, you and I were, were talking about this a little bit earlier. There rarely does a coach go through a season where there's no injury. Um, knock on wood, every coach does. Um, but I tore my ACL my sophomore year of college, and there was never a doubt in my mind and no talks about, well, if you don't, you know, come back, you're not going to get your scholarship. Different sports, different schools, different coaches may be different in each in each scenario. Um, but typically in the volleyball world, um, you can come back from most injuries. And there's also a medical red shirt offered depending on how many games you play. So very complicated, <laughs> but the short answer of that is typically no, your scholarship is not going to be taken away unless you do something illegal or you become in, <laughs> in, in, ineligible, honestly. Um, you know, as, as long as you put in the PT time and, and you're working towards getting better, um, your scholarship should be there uh, after the fact. This is a question from Don. He had a senior who had some injuries throughout the season and there wasn't a lot of good videos because of COVID, because of cancellations of tournaments last year. Um, what were the strategies that they could work around that? So basically had an injury, you know, had COVID last year, limited video. What would you suggest at this time? Because they don't have full game play that they are wanting to share or haven't recorded yet. Yeah. And, um, you know, if she's fully recovered from the injury and she can do some private lessons or one-on-ones with her coach 
I would definitely suggest that skills video type of thing. Um, if she's doing some rehab still, uh, I, if you want to be very, um, you know, proactive or creative, you can even you know, video some PT stuff. But honestly, I would do, I would go to the, um, the skills video one on one private lesson type of, uh, of route to get some supplemental video until you can get on the court. Okay. Oh, and the other thing I, I was thinking about that is getting a letter from your coach. So talking about your past play, talking about your character, talking about your work ethic, um, you know, you can ask your coach for that type of letter of reference type of thing. Mike, I'm sorry, do you have any additional comments right now based on what we just discussed as far as scholarships or um, the Indeed, process? Video, yeah. Yeah, video highlights. Well, what is funny because <laughs> when when I was coming out, we didn't have video. It was all like yeah, right. eight millimeters. So it was a little right. bit different. Now you can put, uh, you know, as you much information put, out there. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think even if you have even for the person that was just injured and didn't have much from last year, if you have anything from the prior year mm -hmm. uh, that you can use and, and, and send out. Uh, I think the way they do it today is amazing to get all the information out to coaches and, and all the video players and the highlights. So as much as you can get out and really, if you can go, if you don't have anything from last year, you can go to the prior year uh, and uh, use some of that uh, video. Yeah. Okay, so one of the questions came in that um, their high school junior was injured. It's the ACL, like you were saying. Um, she's she's past her, sorry, she's four months post-op. She's ready to go. She. You know, knowing she has a good amount of highlights already, do we start the process back up? Like she was being recruited in this process, had an injury, and then is now starting to rehab and start to play again. So knowing that she already has a good amount of highlights, how do they start the process back up? Mm -hmm. And it, it's similar to the start of the process, right? So you kind of reevaluate your preferences. If your, your target list is the same, maybe you've been talking to a few coaches, but it's been a you know, you've got quiet, <laughs> which is typical. Um, but you do want to be honest and you would say, you know, I had a had an injury. I'm well on my way to recovery. I'm starting up new practice, you know, new practices or practice schedule and getting back on the court on in one month, whatever it is, like whatever your, your PT schedule is. And then just talk about um, what you're, you know, why you like their program, uh, why you're interested in their program, what you're doing this summer and basically started off sooner than later, um, especially with it being a junior, those coaches can talk to you. So there's no restrictions on them communicating back with you or, or setting up a Zoom call or a FaceTime or a call, just a regular phone call um, and getting you on campus for either late summer camps or even on a visit in the fall. So sooner rather than later, especially that she's already like at least halfway through her PT. Yeah, and she's a junior, so this would be an op opportune time for her to go after that. Yeah. yeah. As far as talking about scholarships and money, what point in the process should the athlete start to ask questions? You know, such as what are the scholarship opportunities for me at your at your university? Mm -hmm. And this this is a good it's a hard topic to bring up as a 16, 17 year old, right? So parents can get into this process, and I'm sure Mike can talk about financial questions that are hard to, to discuss. Um, but I think, you know, a, 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 when the coaches are going to talk to you about it is definitely on a campus visit. So if they, uh, you know, bring you on to campus, ask you to campus, um, tell you, yeah, we'd love to get you to campus. That's definitely an, a time that you can talk about scholarship availability, roster positions, that type of thing. The hard part on that is, you know, you, you don't want to fly cross country if it's an unofficial visit, which is you paying for the expenses. If it's an official visit, then the school's paying for all that, so that's fine. Um, but if it's unofficial and you're having to, to pay your way, you want to have that conversation prior to going to the, the visit, right? So um, that's that's an easier question on a phone call where they've invited you to campus, but it's unofficial. You have to pay your way. Then you can ask about, um, you know, hey, coach, I'd love to come out there, but financially, you know, we want to be smart about our travel. Do you have any scholarships? opportunities for this position. Um, and that is an okay question to ask. I know it feels a little forthcoming, right? And, and kind of like blunt, um, but it, 
it's not fair for you guys as recruits to pay all this money and go all, all across the country without knowing that they're what kind of opportunity you're flying there and going to visit for. So prior to or at a campus visit, that's when you start asking those types of questions. Mike, do you have any insight on going from the community college to San Jose State? Like what were your thoughts as far as that process? Uh, well, you wanted to find out, you know, what you were going to get, you know, you had a uh, few more offers, I had a couple more offers uh, out of junior college uh, than I came, had out of high school and, you know, from the four universities. So uh, one, you know, we having to be down in, uh, in uh, Tennessee. So I, I took the visit and, and they were serious uh, as was San Jose, but, you know, I wanted to know what I was going to get, you know, what the opportunity was going to be for me. And obviously I actually went to the place that didn't guarantee me a, to play. And, and at Middle Tennessee State, they said I could play right away. At, at uh, San Jose State, they didn't say you're going to have to compete. Uh, so I wanted to go, and actually I wanted to stay in California too. So <laughs> you know, that, that was you know, a little bit different going down to, uh, to Tennessee and staying in California because I went to junior college in California. But the, it, it just gave me an opportunity to compete, and that's all I wanted. And... Uh, you know, San Jose State was uh, fortunately a, a big time passing school. So that was, you know, what I wanted where Middle Tennessee State didn't really suit my skill level. So, uh, and, and that's how I made the decision, but you know, I wanted, and then I also want to know that it was going to be full ride academics, books, the whole nine. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I got. So uh, you definitely want to know that. And, and I don't think, you know, asking for it, you know, upfront is, is being too blunt. Because, you know, coaches and, and you know, they, they don't have any problems being blunt. So I, <laughs> I, I think you have to be the same way with them because, it, unfortunately, it kind of is like a business. And that's how you want to approach it and do what's best for you. And, and, then, and, and, and it shouldn't shock them, right? Like, no, everybody not, knows not, that not at all. somewhere along the line, a financial scholarship conversation is going to happen. It, it, so. Exactly. <laughs> you have to be just as forthright with them as they will be with you. And, and, and I don't think, you know, students or student athletes should feel bad if they talk to a bunch of different, you know, coaches and, and, and don't let them give you a guilt trip because mm -hmm. unfortunately that's what they do sometimes. And, and you gotta be, you know, you have to take care of yourself and do what's best for you and your family. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's hard, hard to hear the answer, right? Because sometimes we don't ask a question because we don't want to hear the answer. Right. It, it, exactly. Negative. But it's so much better to know yes or no versus yep. maybe, I don't know, you know, ask the question. <laughs> ask the question. And, and then you can know if you can eliminate that school from, from, your, from your process. Right. And then yeah. you can narrow it down a lot faster than it, it, if you get, uh, it gets strung out. Yeah. You got to separate yourself from that response, though. I know it, you take it personally. It, sometimes. It's hard. It is. You, you take it personal, but but you, you got to understand if you, if you treat it like a business, which it is, even though it's still amateur sport, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. still a business for the school. Yeah. And, and, and as parents and kids treat it the same way, I think you make better decisions. I think you need to interview them as much as they're interviewing you exactly. and make sure that it's a good fit all the way around. What is your advice? Let's say that you have a D1 scholarship, you know, full ride scholarship, but at, at the same time, they'd rather get more playing time at a different level of college, or they'd rather have the academic experience and more play time. You know, how, how would a player navigate that? Yeah. And that's a, and that's a balance, right? And that's a personal preference, I would say too. So when I was offered at Illinois, they, I wasn't guaranteed playing time either. And I actually basically sat the bench in my freshman year and got in a few games. I had started every single game as a freshman in high school, every single club game. I was not used to sitting on the bench. Um, and But I wanted to measure myself against the best of the best. The, the Big Ten in volleyball is the best of the best. So I wanted to see how I could compete against them. Um, and that's not a right or wrong answer. There's some kids that like to be the big fish in the small pond and starting in all conference freshman year. And some of the 1% of the 1% are those freshmen at the big 10 level, yeah. but the, it really is not a, a right or wrong answer. It's what your preference is. So asking about where, where do you see me uh, on the team as a freshman? What's my role? What would my role be? Asking those types of questions in a, a respectful manner, not Am I going to play right away? Like, <laughs> don't show them too much attitude. 
Um, but be confident about asking those questions because then you, again, like Mike had mentioned, you know where you stand financially, you know where you stand um, athletically and in, in your role in the team. And a coach maybe at a Division II or NAI school would say, hey, you know, you're our number one outside recruit you're, and you'll probably start your freshman year and every year after that, you know. Um, but remember, coaches have to recruit better than what they have. That's their whole job. That's why they get paid. <laughs> so if a freshman, um, you start as a freshman and you don't train well and you're not putting in the time, that coach is going to recruit a freshman to, to outdo you, right? So there's always um, give and take to all that. Do you guys have any advice as athletes going into thinking back to when you were in high school, you know, going into college, what were some of the things you wish you would have known at, at that time in high school versus looking back now saying, Oh, if I had only known blah, 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 you know, <laughs> just trying to uh, Mike. <laughs> let you go. Well, I, I tell you what's funny. It says know your school and where you're going because I really didn't have, other schools offer me scholarship or an opportunity to play. The junior college I went to was uh, we ran the triple option. I wasn't a triple option quarterback. So I went there <laughs> for a couple of years and luckily I got to San Jose State. But, but you know, even though it is not wasn't ideal, it worked out, yeah. um, you know, for me. But uh, really is, 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 is how you train and prepare yourself uh, going into uh, – you know, into college, uh, where I went, just happened to be one of the best junior colleges in the country. Uh, and won the National Junior College Championship two out of three years. So the recruits that came there were from like all over the country and from Texas, Florida, and you talk about top, um, top uh, recruits. And a lot of guys that are getting scholarships, you know, to four year schools, but just really knowing where you're going. And, 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 you know, it's easy to say now, but back then I just took what was available and I went and, and it worked out. Uh, yeah. But just be as knowledgeable of where you're going uh, better than I was, should I say. <laughs> do your due diligence, right? Do your research. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I think that's important too on not just the school and the program, but also your the teammates and the coaches. You know, I, I made a decision. It's you know, any Big Ten school is going to be great academics and great volleyball, no matter where you're going. So my final decisions came on how that visit was and how I related with the with the teammates, the team that was there on the on the official visit, and the coaches in their coaching style. Um, I actually verbally committed to Michigan, and then the coach left for medical reasons, retired. And I decommitted and went to Illinois because I didn't know that new coach at Michigan. I committed to the coach almost and to the players. And Illinois was a super second close, or, you know, second place. But I knew that coach at Illinois way better than I knew the new coach at Michigan. I'm good friends with him now, and we kid about it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he's like, "Well, I would keep you as a middle," and I moved to the outside in, in yeah. Illinois. So I was like, "Phew, I'm glad I didn't." <laughs> So, it, it, you know, but making that decision on the players who you're going to be around almost 24 hours a day sometimes um, and that coach who's going to be training you for four years. So doing the due diligence that way, too. And then I think it was just lucky, you know, football is a fall sport, too. So I'm sure, Mike, you went early, you know, before school started and you had instantly you had upperclassmen kind of looking out for you. You had a group of, of people that, um, you know, were going to help you out. So that was, was awesome because I probably would have gotten a lot more trouble if I wasn't playing football in college. <laughs> Coming from a super small high school, which like we had 700 in our entire high school. My first economics class at Illinois had 500 kids in it. So I was like, my whole school is in this classroom. <laughs> they don't know that I'm here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I think what, what Sue said is prime example. She did what was best for her that she mm -hmm. originally committed to Michigan, but then she didn't feel comfortable with the person that was going to come in. And some people don't make that uh, that decision with, until it's too late and they end up having to transfer. You made right. it prior, and I think that was key in, in you know, your success at, uh, at Illinois. Yeah, and it, it's helped me with a ton of conversations with families that we've worked with because they get all freaked out about stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I can give you examples of tearing my ACL. I can give you examples of decommitting. <laughs> Um, and there's, as long as you know your guiding light or your guiding principle, 
it's easier to make decisions. It's easier to ask those tougher questions um, and make a make a decision for you, not oh I have to go to Division One because my club coach needs me to go there for their reputation, right? Or I need to be a doctor because my dad was a doctor. You know, let, let's make it your decision as a student athlete. Yeah, you do you, not someone else. Make sure no, it's right. what you're supposed to be doing. Any last co closing comments? I feel like we covered all of the questions that were emailed in. Um, thank you guys for joining. This was fantastic. And I hope that this helps girls continue to play at whatever level, um, whatever school that they end up choosing. And it's just a great informational session. We will still have uh, the sign up to send out the recording next weekend after the next Crossroads as well. I will, yeah, I'll, I will say that only there's almost 450,000 high school volleyball athletes, women, girls play in high school. And it's, it's, it's number one on, on basketball now, so good job, volleyball. <laughs> but 5% of those kids go on to play college. So if you're even, it doesn't matter what division you're playing, you're in the top 5% um, of high school volleyball players that go on and play. So keep that in mind, you know, enjoy the process. No matter what division you're looking at, you're, you're you know, 5%, <laughs> basically, you're top 5%. Well, I think like you said, I mean, sports brings people together. You have great relationships. It immediately gives you a bond and a group that you can be in college with. And so regardless of the division, I think you should look at your volleyball team in college and see, even if it's for academics, and then you go and look and explore. Mm -hmm. I think that people should continue in sports regardless of what role or what level. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of club divisions out there too. So if you're, you want to go to a big school and a big university like Illinois, their the club team there was, was awesome. We would, we would hang out together. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to play volleyball, sand volleyball in the summer together. So it was, it was a great experience and, and they get to travel still to, to the uh, big 10 conference, but it's at, the, at a club level. So it's still competitive. Mike, any final words? I would just want to wish uh, everyone much success and uh, the best down the road and with your decisions and choices and just go at it 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> And stop by then, CSA booth. <laughs> if you're yeah, coming next I weekend. Will see you, I will see you this weekend, Sue. I'm going to come say hi. Awesome. That'd be great. <laughs> Finally, in person. Yes, <laughs> Get to meet yes. each other. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, you guys have a great evening.